morning, uh, Mr. Chisholm. Uh, there's no need to stand up when I come in, by the way, not in this inquiry. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, and uh, you're all sitting comfortably in, respectively, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, that's going from left to right at the top, and Scotland at the bottom. I'm sorry for referring to you by... I'm not actually sorry for referring to my nations. It's the easiest way of identifying to those who are listening your particular perspective uh, and uh, the organisations, the civil services for which you have some responsibility. Uh, but welcome to you all. Can I just explain the arrangements? Uh, we have three of you remote. Uh, we have uh, Alex Chisholm uh, of England uh, from... Uh, uh, and the nation um, sitting before us. Uh, the, the, your, uh, the, your audience uh, is a, a number of people here who are a mixture of participants and core participants, uh, lawyers to your left uh, as you look, Mr. Chisholm, uh, and uh, at the back, uh, representatives of the press, in particular today, representatives from S. TV, Scottish TV. <coughs> uh, Ms. Richards will ask the questions in a moment, but beyond this um, room, uh, you will be talking to an audience, some of whom will be in a breakout room in this building, but most of whom will be on either YouTube or live stream, probably numbering well into three figures. So that's who you are talking to. Uh, Mary will ask each of you to take uh, the oaths, uh, <coughs> and after that, Ms. Richards will uh, invite you to answer her questions. Mary. Please state your full name. Alex Chisholm. <coughs> take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Right. Where should we start? Uh, <laughs> if we um, start with Mr. Goodall, please state your full name. Um, my name is Andrew Goodall. And taking the book in your raised hand, repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Now if we go to Ms. Fraser, please state your full name. My name is Leslie Fraser. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth and now Miss Brady please state your full name my name is Jane Brady and repeat after me I do solemnly sincerely I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm, and truly declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Can I check that you can see and hear me, those of you who are remote? Good. Um, I'm going to um, start just by asking each of you to tell us um, briefly your job title and current role and how long you've been in your current post. 
Can I start with Ms Brady? Um, yeah, my job title is Head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and I've been in post since the 1st of September 2021. And um, in, a, in a sentence or so, what does that role entail? As Head of the Civil Service, um, I am Principal Advisor to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister uh, of the Northern Ireland Executive. We have a separate constitutional arrangement from the UK government um, and I lead, a depart I lead nine permanent secretaries um, of our departments within the executive office. Thank you. Dr Goodall, your, your job title and role? I'm the permanent secretary for uh, Welsh Government um, and I started in the role in November 2021. Uh, and again, in a sentence or so, what does your job as permanent secretary to the Welsh Government entail? <coughs> It means that I act as uh, Head of Policy for uh, the Civil Service in Welsh Government. I'm Chief Advisor to the First Minister of Wales and I am in charge of running the organisation. Ms Fraser. Um, I am Director General Corporate for the Scottish Government and I uh, report to the Permanent Secretary in the Scottish Government. I have responsibility for the corporate operations of um, the Scottish Government, including communications and ministerial support, um, our people activity, legal advice, financial and so on. Thanks. And uh, Mr Chisholm. Hi, um, I've got two job titles. One is Permanent Secretary of the Cabinet Office and Accounting Officer there, uh, and the second is Civil Service Chief Operating Officer, where I'm responsible for uh, functional operations, efficiency and reform. I've been doing that since April 20. Um, now, none of you has had any um, involvement in decision making regarding the matters which this inquiry is investigating, as I understand it. Um, and I can see everybody nodding, uh, including um, Mr Chisholm in person here. Now, it, picking up on themes which the inquiry has been exploring in its hearings over the last um, two to three years, um, you were each asked to address a range of issues in your statements. Um, the measures and incentives that would support candour in the civil service, um, how to mitigate against groupthink in the civil service, um, and how to help the civil service guard against um, approaching issues with a closed mind or, or memory illusion. Um, and, and what I'm going to do is ask each of you in turn to tell us a little about some of the measures in place in your respective countries. Uh, and then once I've done that, I'm going to ask um, all four of you a number of, of, of general questions picking up on those themes. So I'm going to start with Ms Fraser in Scotland. Um, can you just tell us, first of all, Ms Fraser, how your role as a member of what you describe as the executive team fits within the Scottish Civil Service? Yeah, so I'm um, also an accountable officer and, uh, res and report to the permanent secretary, who is the principal accountable officer in the Scottish Government. And we both have direct responsibilities and accountabilities in person to Parliament for the way that the civil service operates here. So um, as part of that leadership team, it's my responsibility to ensure that um, civil servants are providing the best possible advice and support to ministers and that includes evidence uh, well um, advice that is evidence-based and that's taking advice from a range of different sources um, and that that can be tested um, and is and can be published where that's um, appropriate as well that we're drawing on good professional advice from lawyers and um, from our financial advisors uh, from program project managers from our expert um, advisors on science or uh, social policy um, and so on um, and that the proper governance um, is in place around all of those processes um, as well so that we have where necessary program boards to look at uh, complex or difficult areas that need to be uh, developed and um, that we have the appropriate checks and balances um, in place to ensure that ministers are getting the best possible um, advice um, from all of the civil servants with whom they interact. Now, um, dealing then specifically with issues relating to candour, there is in Scotland, as indeed there are in all parts of the United Kingdom, a civil service code. Um, um, 
so as to avoid the need to look at each code, because they are largely um, the same across the four nations, um, I'm, I'm going to invite you to look at the Scottish one, because we haven't looked at that specifically in inquiry hearings so far. It's RLIT 301819, please, Lawrence. Yes, so the, um, the Scottish uh, Civil Service Code does indeed mirror very closely um, its uh, other UK counterparts, um, and that requires um, civil servants to um, always act with um, openness, um, honesty, transparency, um, and uh, to be selfless in the way that they um, provide that, that information um, and advice to um, ministers. It sets out the way that civil servants must always be impartial, so able to um, support ministers of the day, but always conscious that um, they will need to be able to support um, another administration in the future government and to be able to equally support them uh, to be able to deliver their priorities. Um, so it's an it's a absolutely um, foundational and important uh, document um, for us. Um, and of course it's mirrored then in the ministerial code which requires ministers then to be able to um, uphold those uh, duties and responsibilities um, of openness and objectivity and impartiality and integrity in the way that they work with the civil service. And, and I just want to flag up um, and then ask you a little more about what in practice the civil service in Scotland does, but just flag up the two values of honesty and objectivity. So if we go to page five, please, Lawrence. Um, so we, we have the four values of integrity, honesty, objectivity, and impartiality. And the two I just want to focus on as perhaps most relevant to issues um, uh, that the inquiry has been exploring. Honesty, setting out facts and relevant issues, truthfully correct any errors as soon as possible. Um, and then if we go down to objectivity, you must provide information and advice, including advice to ministers on the basis of the evidence, accurately present the options and facts, take decisions on the merits of the case, take due account of expert and professional advice, and you must not ignore inconvenient facts or relevant considerations when providing advice or making decisions. And then if we just go over to the bottom of the next page, please. Paragraph 16, under the heading Rights and Responsibilities says that the Scottish executive and its agencies have a duty to make you, as i.e. civil servants, aware of this code and its values. And then we don't need to go through it, but the code sets out a, a, um, advice on reporting concerns to a line manager or to the nominated officer or to the Civil Service Commission. Um, yes. now, so now that's the code. What, what does the Scottish government or Scottish civil service do to try and ensure that these values, and in particular honesty and objectivity, are actually adhered to by civil servants in everything that they do? No, as I say, it's absolutely um, fundamental and foundational. So that's um, very important uh, training that is given to everybody on induction, uh, training specifically about the duties and responsibilities um, under the code. Um, there's a wide range of training then which colleagues get as they join the civil service here in Scotland um, and that they uh, will receive uh, throughout their careers. That includes um, how to work with evidence effectively, how to look for those multiple sources of evidence which are always necessary uh, to find in any complex um, issues that you're uh, looking for. So that will include, for example, of course, um, published qualitative evidence, both at national level and at local level, but also the um, evidence uh, from partners and stakeholders, and indeed increasingly uh, directly with um, users of services or the areas of policy which we are seeking to develop, recognising that for government and policy to be effective, then we have to engage directly with those um, with whom, um, you know, for whom the policy and delivery is being um, designed. There are a series then of checks and balances that are uh, set within that. So um, in developing any policy or advice, 
um, you should always be drawing on uh, professional expertise. So that will include, of course, um, analysts um, and, um, and professional advisors of that sort, but it will also um, include where appropriate um, our scientific advisor, um, our um, policy advisor, our eco economic advisor, and so on, and professional expertise from our lawyers, from our um, finance teams, uh, from commercial teams, uh, program project management expertise. So there's a whole range of professional expertise as well. And as an accountable officer, I will be looking for assurance from those who work um, directly with me that they've got proper processes in place both to help and support those colleagues who are producing that advice but also to quality assure that advice and to check that it's getting the proper levels of challenge um, and um, test before it goes forward to ministers um, and throughout the whole policy and delivery um, process and we're very much helped for example by non-executive directors um, here in Scottish Government um, by a very open and positive relationship on the whole, I would say, with, with um, a number of stakeholders and partners with whom we work um, very um, closely and also um, in the um, open way in which we try to um, you know, publish and make transparent and open the, the evidence in which, that we're uh, relying on in the advice that we're giving to ministers. Uh, you, um, sorry, course, carry on. But yes, oh, sorry, I, I was going to go on and say that um, uh, internal audit, uh, aud the role of Audit Scotland, parliamentary scrutiny, absolutely um, critical elements of the, that kind of whole system uh, that provides um, me with a sense of the quality assurance uh, that I'm looking for in the, um, as I see policy and advice being developed. Thanks. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the training that's provided to civil servants in relation to the code. You, your statement also tells us that Scottish ministers are briefed on the provisions both of the Scottish Ministerial Code and the Civil Service Code. And you reference there being induction sessions for ministers in 2021, including advice on working with the civil service. Is there now effectively a training programme for ministers in Scotland in relation to the, the, the kind of values that underpin both the codes and the, and the, 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 the Nolan principles? I would um, characterise it as an induction process with um, um, the offer of uh, further training and advice um, if ministers would find that helpful. Um, so this has been a, a relatively recent um, development for us to uh, put this into a more formal footing um, and introduced after the uh, 2021 elections. Um, and I think um, very much welcomed by ministers to have that um, clarity of the whole range of um, duties and responsibilities that they hold, but also uh, guidance and advice about how to work with the civil service, um, including where they can go for help, support and advice in the event that they don't feel that either they're receiving the performance that they're looking for or, for example, um, where um, there are tensions arising in the working environment which, which need to be dealt with effectively and, and quickly. Now, in relation to measures to mitigate groupthink, um, you drew attention in your statement to something called Scotland's National Performance Framework. Um, I don't think we need to put it up on screen. In fact, sorry, Lawrence, we can take down the, the code. Thank you. Um, can, could you again just tell us in, in a sentence or two what, what the National Performance Framework is, but most importantly, how it is you suggest it might be an antidote to groupthink? Yes. The National Performance Framework was established in Scotland in 2007, and it is an, a well-being framework that looks around the range of outcomes that citizens will look for in terms of improving um, their life chances and uh, lives in, in Scotland. Um, since 2007, it's developed considerably. It's now aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and it's also been placed on a statutory footing um, through the Scottish Parliament. So it has um, all party um, support. 
because it is a holistic framework looking at economic, environmental, social, and the whole range of outcomes, um, that is the way in which Scottish uh, civil servants are trained to look at issues. Um, and uh, reporting to ministers, we would expect to see those different aspects um, drawn through into advice. And that multifaceted, multi-outcome um, approach, I think, does help us um, to ensure that we're looking as far as possible in um, a holistic way um, at the evidence and the issues that our um, ministers are seeking advice on. You also reference in your statement something called the In the Service of Scotland vision, with what you describe as five core values, integrity, inclusivity, collaboration, innovation and kindness. Um, how does that vision or those values um, assist in um, ensuring that civil service decisions um, or civil service advice is, um, uh, is taken in the best possible way and as consistently as possible with the values of the code? The In the Service of Scotland vision and values is um, our uh, vision and values for the transformation of the Scottish Government, for the ongoing improvement of ourselves as a, as a civil service. And it links, um, you'll see that the values link with the, the values in the national performance um, framework. Again, this is really homing in on the areas where we feel um, we need to um, have um, good focus at this point in time. Um, so uh, collaboration, that person-centered inclusiveness, um, recognizing that, um, you know, for the majority of citizens in Scotland, um, government and public services work pretty well a lot of the time, but they don't always work perfectly, particularly um, for around a fifth of the population um, you know, who suffer from deprivation or um, don't have access to the same levers of power that others do. And therefore, we need to pay particular attention to that. And inclusiv inclusivity and kindness um, speak to um, that work, which is very much underway. So in the service of Scotland is um, how we brigade all of that improvement work um, for our colleagues and help guide them through the areas that we feel need particular um, ongoing attention um, within the government um, uh, over, this, over this period. So it's designed as the civil service um, response, as it were, to um, the national performance framework, which is a Scotland-wide outcomes framework. Uh, and then specifically in relation to what, what you've described as, in, in, again in your statement, as a, a person-centred or user-centred approach to decision-making, you refer to that exposing civil servants to external points of view, assisting in the challenging of collective assumptions. How, how in practice does that work? Yeah. I'll perhaps give you an example, just drawing from um, how we've developed our new social security system. Um, in Scotland, um, because that has very much lived the values and the approach of the National Performance Framework, but put um, users and those clients who will use the, the services of Social Security Scotland right at the heart. Um, there, we brought together uh, around 2,500 um, um, people who volunteered to be part of this process with us. They were already um, users of the DWP um, um, social security system. And we asked them to help us design every aspect of the way in which Social Security Scotland would be established and the way it would run. Everything from the colour of the letters that would arrive right the way through the training of staff through to how processes would be established and what sort of feedback they would want to see to be um, ensured that they would be treated with dignity and respect, which was the fundamental point that um, those, um, those clients uh, said that was important to them, and how we would ensure that we could create a, an organisation that would respond in that way. Social Security Scotland has indeed been now established using that insight from those um, very uh, generous um, um, citizens. 
and um, we continue to monitor the way in which Social Security Scotland operates and the whole system operates through a charter, um, a Social Security charter that again has been developed um, by um, um, people drawn from that user experience panel and they have established a set of measures um, that enable us to monitor on an ongoing basis whether people are actually feeling, you know, dignity and respect, are they getting the right kind of information, are staff properly trained, are the processes working in practice um, for them, are they seeing learning be, um, being applied year on year um, in the areas that they are identifying for improvement and how is social security then planning for the future. So trying to ensure that we're being open and transparent with that whole system loop but drawing from that direct experience of those who use the system in order to drive that improvement. So would it be right to understand that is an example of what I think is sometimes referred to as co-production, in which an area of policy, uh, um, you actually involve those who are affected or may be affected by the policy in the, the, the design of, of, of the policy itself? Indeed, yes, we've set out principles for involving people where we see that as a, a really important um, mechanism in Scotland to try and get policy and delivery right, you know, as close as possible to first time and to try and avoid, um, well, one, unintended consequences, but two, you know, what could potentially be a waste of the taxpayers' money if we don't get things right first time and that user um, involvement and experience can be absolutely invaluable um, in driving that. None of these things, of course, is ever a magic bullet um, here. It's always about um, that constant vigilance and looking to see, you know, what all the different sources of evidence are um, telling you about where the, where the system is working and where improvement needs to be made. Um, and then the final question in relation to Scotland for now. Um, you have referred in your statement to, the, to a specific policy raising a concern under the civil service code and whistleblowing policy. Uh, what, what's, um, mm. what's the purpose of that policy and, and how effective um, do you think it is within the Scottish civil service? We do, and in common with my colleagues um, from the other nations, um, have a whistleblowing um, policy and we have nominated officers that colleagues can approach in confidence in the event that they believe um, elements of the civil service code <coughs> excuse me, are being um, drawn into distribute or they have a concern and they haven't been able to, to address that through other mechanisms. Um, it's not a frequently used policy. Um, and um, you know we're um, heartened through our people survey to know that people understand how they should and could raise concerns through that route should they need to. Um, I think one of the concerns I have is that that can feel um, you know a very big and difficult step for colleagues uh, to take, albeit that it is in confidence and it is a member of staff here in the in the Scottish government that they would they would speak to. We've taken steps over the last um, uh, two years to improve um, sort of access to uh, routes uh, should people um, have concerns, even if those are early concerns that might not, for example, require them to go to um, a nominated officer through the whistleblowing process. And we've created a propriety and ethics function um, within, the, within the Scottish Government, very much um, helped, I should say, by um, Alex Chisholm and colleagues in the Cabinet Office um, and drawing on the um, experience and expertise there. But that um, group of colleagues gives people the informal opportunity to test and say, there's something that I think might be not quite right here. I'm not quite sure if I've got a concern, but I'd like to talk to you about it. And those colleagues, again, can just act with um, absolute con confidentiality and may be able to spot patterns or um, help uh, those colleagues uh, crystallise an issue or find routes uh, to raise a problem. So we've just really um, ensuring that we've got good and appropriate routes as far as possible uh, for colleagues to be able to, to raise concerns if they have them. Thanks. Thank you, Ms Fraser.
Um, Dr Goodall, I'm going to turn to you and to Wales. Um, the civil service in Wales has a civil service code, and we don't need to put it on screen, but for the benefit of um, the transcript, it's RLIT 301820. But it's essentially in the same form as the civil service code in England and the civil service code for Scotland. Um, now, obviously, a code is a, is a good starting point in terms of uh, encouraging candour, openness, honesty, objectivity. But what's done in Wales to try and ensure that civil servants in Wales adhere to the code at all times in, in the performance of their duties? Yeah, as, uh, as Leslie has already said, it, it, it is a consistent code uh, across our different experiences, but obviously we translate it into our particular setting. And our status um, in Welsh Government is that we are UK civil service, uh, working in support of Welsh Government and of course we therefore have to ensure that we adapt those including our own version of a ministerial code uh, as well but as you say uh, simply having the framework is is insufficient it's really important that this is embedded in the organization in, in a number of ways uh, we do that again uh, in a similar fashion uh, to how it's been described in Scotland to ensure that uh, any member of staff joining the civil service as part of their induction is made fully aware of the code and its importance. Um, we ensure that there is refresher training which is provided through the organisation that's discharged by our teams of staff who deal with governance uh, and ethics. And that is wider than simply the code itself. We also set that in the context of uh, the Nolan principles, of course, which act as a broader guide for us working in public services. And again, I would say are very visible in the way in which we look to exercise our responsibilities. Um, but we also try to ensure that, um, that the practice is visible. So, you know, I'm really clear about um, ensuring that in dealing with the senior team within Welsh Government, um, that staff will expect to see those behaviours portrayed within the organisation. Um, I said earlier that I had only joined the organisation a year ago, um, and alongside um, the status of the Civil Service Code, I've actually been able to focus myself on a process of talking through the values of working for Welsh Government, uh, Welsh Government 2025, which uh, again will sound very similar to the Scottish experience. Uh, and I was really struck in that exercise about how important actually um, the status of the Civil Service Code was as we were describing <coughs> other important criteria about how we wanted to support improvements in outcomes for the Welsh population. And you know, civil servants actually wanted to make sure that these things were absolutely understood together and aligned. Uh, and in fact, in our values that we've been developing, we really call out the honesty and transparency in, in that process too. Um, but we also um, try to ensure that we have an understanding of the manner in which uh, these things can be checked through the organisation as well. So, you know, there are opportunities for us to be subject to scrutiny internally through our internal audit, uh, through use of our non-executive um, members as well, who will ensure that the civil service is acting. We have our own policies and ways of getting advice to the minister that we can scrutinise and re review as well. Um, and just really important that we keep an understanding and awareness of how broad the knowledge is of the Civil Service Code. And our latest staff surveys, which were back in 2020, we're about to go through this again, showed a, a very high level of awareness and understanding from Welsh Government Civil Service about the code itself. And is there any form of training or induction or briefing for ministers on the Nolan principles and the values um, recorded in the Ministerial Code and Civil Service Code? I think over, over time uh, there may well have been uh, an approach where ministers simply come into their role and, and start from day one. I think certainly all of us have reflected on the importance of ensuring that as new ministers arrive um, into their own responsibilities that they have support in those roles. And yes, there is um, support and training that is given for ministers, uh, both collectively and individually. Uh, with a focus on the ministerial code but as you uh, have described that means that there needs to be also a, a complementary understanding of the way in which ministers would act uh, and behave as well we, we do have some very experienced ministers um, in welsh government some, some of whom have been ministers throughout the, the course of 
devolved government in Wales, um, but we also have new ministers um, who will join during a, um, a parliamentary term, and we need to ensure also, of course, that they are supported. There is a, an open offer from the Director of Propriety and Ethics to, to ensure that any minister who, who wishes to further understand those uh, issues um, can be supported. And should there be any occasions when we feel that there is a need to kind of clarify those areas, perhaps on the back of an individual experience, albeit that may be a very rare Sorry, Dr. Goodall, we just we've lost you. Can you hear us? So, uh, I can hear you. Absolutely. Uh, okay, we, we we lost you. The last thing I think we've got um, um, from you was you were talking about the open offer from the Director of Propriety and Ethics um, for um, ministers who want to go gain further understanding um, into Nolan principles, ministerial and code, and so on. Yeah, I indeed. I think I probably just about came to an end at that point. Thank you. Um, and then in relation to um, particular Welsh-based measures for mitigating against groupthink, um, you've referred in your statement to the promotion of partnership working and the involvement of citizens and service users in decision-making. Um, how does that work in Wales? Is there anything similar to what Ms Fraser described in relation to the involvement of the social security panels? I, I, I think we are uh, approaching similar intentions and outcomes perhaps in, in, in different ways. Uh, I mean, firstly, I think that the availability of the code um, allows us to adopt a way of working more generally. And my experience of working in uh, Welsh public services over many years um, before I came into Welsh Government, I, and my background is in the NHS, uh, is actually of a very close partnership arrangement with a significant level of collaboration across different agencies, um, particularly so organisations that work in the same sectors, but actually much broader than that. And, you know, I would suggest that we saw that very clearly in our experience through the pandemic, where beyond just our own civil service experience, we absolutely needed to reach out to sectors in different ways and use those kind of relationships and networks in place, but translate them probably to a, a much more enhanced level of intervention and development of policy in very extraordinary circumstances. Um, we, uh, we also um, have uh, legislation in place uh, which uh, applies to Welsh Government as well as other public services through the uh, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which was put into place in 2015. And that, um, beyond what we would want to do about collaborating and uh, bringing in citizen experience for reasons of good practice, actually provides statutory responsibilities on public services, and it includes Welsh Government itself. Um, with five ways of working, and two of those uh, responsibilities and duties are collaboration and involvement. So we are subject to an expectation set out in law, and we are subject to review about the way in which we work as Welsh <coughs> Government, and whether we have been able to show um, evidence of compliance with those um, under a commissioner arrangement, and also subject to review by Audit Wales. But I would like to say that, um, of course, noting its status in law, that is actually a very positive set of principles that we work uh, alongside. And I, and I think it does give permission to act in particular ways when we are developing significant policy. And just two br brief examples to refer to, um, when it, as the Director General for Health and Social Services and the NHS Wales Chief Executive, I was uh, involved in uh, 2018 uh, launching um, a 10-year joint health and social care plan. Uh, that had been through processes, uh, firstly by drawing in the experience of um, an expert panel with both national and international experience to give advice. It was a, uh, described as a parliamentary review. And then the process of developing a Healthy Wales, uh, which was that long-term plan, uh, was actually done in co-production with uh, system stakeholders and with representatives across Wales. And I thought that we uh, were able to discharge uh, a plan which was much more owned by the system, but which really targeted the issues and concerns, particularly looking into the future as well. But most recently during this year, we were able to launch an anti-racist plan for Wales, which was absolutely based on uh, working with uh, community groups, representatives across Wales in full co-production, including wanting to ensure that the, the lived experience was able to influence the way in which policy was developed. So um, that is the civil service, not just um, looking at its own evidence and experience in a room by itself, but absolutely reaching across to those very significant experiences. And so the legislation has enabled that, 
but also it's about thinking beyond the legislation itself. It's about knowing that these are the right ways of ensuring that you have good policy in development. And then, um, again, final question for Wales for now. Is there any um, policy uh, in Wales equivalent to the policy described by Ms Fraser in relation to whistleblowing and raising concerns under the ministerial code? Yeah, yes, we, we, we have um, uh, equivalent versions in place. So we, we, we do have a complaints unit uh, in, in place, which does allow us to make sure that um, before a whistleblowing approach is taken within the organisation, uh, that there are opportunities for actually complaints to be received by Welsh Government on our own duties and responsibilities for us to ensure that we approach those uh, with candour and with transparency. Uh, but we have the equivalent whistleblowing arrangements uh, in place internally. Um, I think it's really important that it is there as a final phase, because I would be disappointed if um, staff and colleagues working within the organisation felt that they were unable to appropriately raise this at the right level in the organisation through their line management arrangements. But it's there to give trust and confidence that should there be real concerns and a need for confidentiality, that there is an avenue for staff to pursue should they really need to uh, go down that route as well. And so. Um, really important to keep uh, impressing how the code helps us to act on a day-to-day -day basis and behave, but you need those contingencies to be available as well. Uh, similar to the Scottish experience, um, actually not, not used very often. I, I hope that is a positive sign. I said earlier that you know, we've got a high level of staff awareness and understanding of the civil service code and some confidence that we would be acting in response to those areas. Uh, but as an example, over the last four years, we've had 40 cases that have come in and under that. Um, there have only been three that have been upheld for concerns out of those 40. So they are, in overall terms, very small numbers, given the numbers of staff we actually have in the organisation. But actually, the data itself shows that many of the issues that are raised are actually resolved along the way. So I hope, again, that is um, some reassurance. Um, and I'm going to turn them next to Ms Brady, Northern Ireland. Now, the constitutional arrangements in Northern Ireland are a little different, um, and, and in particular, the civil service in Northern Ireland is separate from the United Kingdom civil service. Is, is that correct, Ms Brady? Yes, um, that is uh, correct. The constitutional arrangements um, are, are different from the UK government. Um, the um, executive is formed uh, from a mandatory coalition of parties. In the previous um, executive, we had a five-party coalitions, and nominations to those executive seats are provided by party leaders nominating officers, um, and the position of, of first and deputy first minister is provided again under those uh, provisions. So each department, of which there are nine, um, is under the direction and control of that minister for the statutory obligations for that department. However, that is uh, caveated um, by anything that is in terms of significant or cross-cutting needs to be referred to the executive for executive um, le level uh, decisions and also anything that is controversial. Uh, Cross-cutting would imply that there is uh, more than one implication from a departmental uh, to prov provide statutory obligations. So we would have executive level policy uh, decisions brought to that, and I am advisor to that executive. Um, um, it's also of note um, that uh, the uh, perm sex are the accounting officers for those departments, and they operate under the direction and control of their minister for those departmental responsibilities. They are responsible to the assembly from a counting officer perspective, and they report to myself as a line manager um, perspective. Uh, in the executive office, I also have an accounting officer. So I am not an accounting officer at all within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is a different constitutional uh, arrangement. Um, it may just also uh, be, be of, of note to mention my um, entry into the civil service, which was from the 1st of September last year. Um, and that was an open and transparent uh, um, competition. However, it was uh, specifically designed to be open to other entrants and probably particularly re uh, relevant to the group think uh, perspective that, that was tabled in the questions. Uh, my background is from outside the civil service. I am an engineer and have worked for 25 years in the private sector in technology and innovation. Um, and I am the first appointment 
externally as head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service in the 100 years history and the first female as well in that appointment. And you chair something called the Northern Ireland Civil Service Board. As I understand it, that's a board which comprises you and then the, the permanent secretaries of the, the um, executive departments. Um, and, and the role is to provide strategic direction to the civil service in Northern Ireland, is that, is that correct? Absolutely, um, in recognising the constitutional framework of which we operate, um, there is of course a need to look beyond departmental boundaries for many of the objectives that we need to deliver for better outcomes for our citizens, but also to recognise executive level priorities. So since coming into post, we have reconstituted the terms of reference for that Northern Ireland Civil Service Board. And while we are at the early days of, of delivery, we are putting structures in place to support the delivery of those objectives. Those necessarily speak to the code of ethics, which are embedded um, as a core tenant of, of uh, our next board, um, but also in reflecting that many of the activities we need to, we need to deliver on require leadership and a change in culture, so we need to embed those from the, the, the very start. We have worked on a number of work programs and packages which are being developed as part of the next board, and we are on, on uh, ongoing recruitment for three independent non-executive members of the board, which we provided uh, references to um, in, our, um, in our one of our annexes, that those are due to complete uh, later this month. Specifically within that, we are looking for individuals who will provide us that constructive challenge, but also from a multidisciplinary background, again, to, um, to mitigate against potential for groupthink, but also to bring those constructive aspects forward. Uh, the areas that we're developing under the, the next uh, board terms of reference cover culture and ethics, organisational translation, diversity and inclusion, but also how we deliver the significant areas that we need to from a citizens-led approach that require <coughs> departmental working uh, to achieve some of the, those outcomes as well. So both at a policy level, um, our intent, and we have started, is that we will be providing collective advice as well to the executive to provide some level of joined up propositions in terms of the, the issues that we're, we're facing it to for the next mandate. Now, in terms of a civil service code, um, um, it's, it's, the Northern Ireland Civil Service has its own specific code of ethics. Uh, we'll just look at that briefly. It's RLIT 301818, please, Lawrence. Um, we can see it's described as a code of ethics, and if we go over the page... We can see there set out the civil service values. Now, although this is um, um, slightly differently um, structured than the, the code in relation to Wales, Scotland and England, I, I think it's right to understand that the values, the civil service values, are here identified in the same form as in the remainder of the United Kingdom. Um, absolutely, they have alignment, uh, and again, alignment with the Nolan Principles, the Seven Principles of Public Life. Um, of particular importance um, uh, for, for us within the Northern Ireland Civil Service when we, when we serve a multi-party coalition is that of impartiality uh, within our civil ser service that we, um, I, I serve two ministers from different uh, political parties, and that's a critical aspect, is that impartial and speaking, speaking truth. Um, and again, basing those information all based on objective analysis and a data-led analysis, which is again one of the themes for our renewal strategy, to have data-informed policy decisions um, or policy um, advice as well. Now you tell us in your statement that this code of ethics was revised and strengthened in light of the report of a, of a public inquiry in Northern Ireland. Um, I'll, I'll come on to that public inquiry in a moment, but do you know what changes were made to the Code of Ethics to put it into the form that we now have? Um, I probably would need to reflect on that, Ms Richards, and, and come, come back to you. One of some of the key areas that were reflected in the um, RHI inquiry was in relation to the impartiality aspect um, and um, ob objectivity in the data-led um, um, uh, decision making in addition to um, making sure that uh, re reliance was not made on previous assertions in terms of policy or, pr or previous 
uh, analysis performed in terms of a policy direction, but I'll come back to you um, with the specific deltas uh, between the, the previous um, version of, of the Code of Ethics. That, 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 that would be very helpful, thank you. And then, um, um, if we just go to um, WYTN 7352006, this is an annex to your statement, Ms Brady. And it's, just, it's the executive response to the RHI inquiry report recommendations and action plan. Now, the RHI, that's a reference to the public inquiry into renewa renewable heat initiatives. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. And, and that was a public inquiry in Northern Ireland, which reported, um, um, I think, around 2020. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, and it made a very wide number of recommendations. I'm not going to ask you about the vast majority of them. But in terms of recommendations that are relevant to the issues which we asked you to consider in, in your statement, um, if we just look at um, page three of this document, please, Lawrence, paragraph eight, we can see in paragraph eight, picking it up in the third line, the RHI inquiry report offers a much wider agenda for change encompassing the professional skills of civil servants, recruitment and capability of staff, governance and financial accountability, record keeping, collaboration, its ability to challenge ministers, special advisors and more senior civil servants in raising concerns. And, and then there's reference not simply to rewriting rules but changes in behaviour. Um, and then if we just go down to paragraph 10, we can see, um, picking it up about five lines down, a reference to all those responsible for the provision of impartial advice, including speaking truth to power. Um, and then, just before I ask you to comment on this, if we go to page 7, Lawrence, paragraph 32, we can see themes that were identified in the course of that public inquiry's work, record-keeping and knowledge transfer, relationship between ministers, special advisors, civil servants, and respective codes of conduct, effectiveness of formal controls, raising concerns, having the right people with the right skills in the right job, collaborate, communication and collaboration, and, and the leadership challenge. Um, now, as I say, I'm not going to ask you to go through the detail of what was a very large three-volume public inquiry report. Um, but in broad terms, what kind of um, areas has the Northern Ireland Civil Service been looking at in response to the concerns raised by that public inquiry report um, insofar as relevant to what we've asked you so issues about groupthink, um, memory illusion candor and so on uh, thank you um, yes identified a, a significant number of areas which have are forming the body of um, some of the activities we're delivering as part of the renewal strategy and um, uh, the, Depart the Executive Office alongside the Department of Finance have a memorandum of understanding to, to progress those. Um, in broad areas, some of the areas uh, were identified was that we had small policy teams who were making a um, decision without uh, significant core capability to make those assessments and they were relying on judgments uh, or information passed to them. In addition, there was a lot, uh, there was significant churn within those departments um, and not significant handover. And there was also findings of insufficient governments and record keeping of which the recommendations um, identify that. Um, also raising concerns um, and in terms of when issues were raised, the effectiveness of, of, of dealing with those. So a number of items have been uh, progressed and again, this is um, a, a, a job of, of uh, transformation and, and we're on, on the steps to, to make that, but it is uh, yet to be complete. Um, the, um, the, in March 2020, there was a revision made to strengthen the ministerial um, code of conduct um, in line with the recommendations from um, the RHI inquiry. Um, and there was also an, an update, as we have also discussed, regarding the next code of ethics and how they can be um, embedded um, more broadly and in, indeed that, that uh, duty of um, impartiality. Uh, we have also um, performed an assessment of the raising concerns policy, which are separate within each department. And in addition to that, we have, looked, we have developed an overall raising a concerns framework that ensures consistency across departments 
we are working with unions um, and also taking advice from our Northern Ireland Audit Office in terms of the framework uh, for delivering uh, those aspects. Key part of that is also looking towards our capability and ensuring we have the correct expertise and part of our uh, workplace, workplace of the Future programme is looking to appoint people with specific expertise in terms of delivering the capability of, of those roles and jobs um, in, in addition, and also how we communicate and collaborate and put in uh, co-design and information from those, co those key sectors in the, the heart of policy making and informed decision um, also. Of course, this is most significantly at the leadership challenge, so that is why the next board has such a critical role in being seen to be the agent of delivery for this change, uh, the governance vehicle for that, but also holding us to be accountable, both within um, the board itself and the appointment of our new non-executives, but also to the executive for the, the response in terms of that leadership challenge. Uh, we will also be uh, held accountable through our standard assembly um, accounting rules also. Um, and I think it's right to understand, I'm afraid I don't have the, the reference in the annexes to your statement, but one of the, the, the areas that emerged from the RHI um, public inquiry report was um, a need for civil servants to um, develop the self-awareness to seek and use external challenge rather than simply relying upon their own internal decision-making and judgment. Um, and, and what, in, in, in particular, if anything, has been done to try and foster that, that self-awareness to seek and use external challenge? Yes, indeed. Um, part of that is in terms of also having the capability um, so that where we have external expertise or embedding that within the organisation. So we have looked towards specific recruitment for apprenticeship type roles to improve those capability um, uh, aspects. Um, a critical part is, is the delivery of our uh, civil service code of, of ethics. Within each department, we also have non-executives who provide that critical challenge and support. There, each department has two perm secretaries, uh, or two uh, non-exec members who provide that level of support and challenge to that. But also, I want to reflect, um, which is that this this is a work in progress as we deliver, and we ha I don't want to over uh, emphasize the, the amount of work we have done. It is a key focus for us, but I see the job of renewal and the work we will be doing in the Civil Service Board will be embedding that in the cultural aspects and allowing that openness to actually challenge, be part of it. So some of it is putting the processes, which we've talked about, the revised Code of Ethics, uh, the revised um, um, the um, Ministerial Code of Conduct, how we, we deliver on those aspects. But a large part of this will be how we make sure we're delivering it at the system level across the service and how we lead at a civil service board and the tone that we set in driving those cultural aspects in addition to, to fulfilling the obligations um, that we have in terms of specific policies and approaches. Thank you, Ms Brady. We can take that down. Um, Mr Chisholm, can I turn then to England? Um, there is obviously a civil service code essentially in the same format as the Scottish um, and um, Welsh civil service codes and, and reflecting the same values across all four parts of the country. Um, sorry, you seem to be under misapprehension. I work for the UK government. There isn't any separate English government or code. There's one civil service code and it has a, a, a Welsh branded version you've heard about, a Scottish branded version. I wouldn't want the inquiry to think there's a separate operation for, for England as part of the So, so the, the, um, uh, the, the, the Welsh version and the Scottish version therefore differ only in the sense they talk about Welsh ministers, Scottish assembly and the like. Correct. It's the one code the, the context, yeah, and the one so. civil service. There is a separate civil service, the Northern Ireland civil service, and a separate diplomatic service, but those are very similar codes as you've noted already for Northern Ireland. And then what is done um, then from the perspective of the UK government mm -hmm. to try and ensure that um, civil servants comply with the values in particular of honesty and objectivity in all that they do? So the foundation is indeed the code and um, that, uh, as, as you have already heard, does embody integrity, uh, honesty, objectivity and impartiality. We've had a big emphasis on making sure all civil servants understand the code. Um, at the most, the most recent people survey showed that 89% did, which is a, um, a high score, um, high, high, still in some parts of the civil service. Um, uh, 
and furthermore, that people understand how to raise a concern when they need to, or uh, indeed if there is a need for formal whistleblowing, that that too is assured and understood. Um, in order to make sure that people have this understanding, that is now a core part of all induction when you join the civil service, um, but also there's opportunities to reinforce that through training, um, and, uh, and indeed those uh, parts of the civil service who find that knowledge of the civil service code is not as high as it should be, then they have more targeted local campaigns to make sure people fully understand it. So that is really the central feature. I can talk about some other ways, but that is the, the core of it. Um, is there any um, briefing induction training offered to ministers in the UK government in the same way as we've heard described by Ms Fraser in relation to Scotland and um, uh, uh, in terms of educating ministers on the Nolan principles and the contents of the ministerial and civil service codes? Yes, indeed. So it's, uh, you know, again, core to the ministerial code. And when, you're, when you become a minister, or indeed when you uh, transfer between departments as a minister, that's one of the first responsibilities of the permanent secretary and of the private uh, offices of the respective ministers to ensure they understand the requirements of the code. And there's lots of reinforcement and central support. I think you heard earlier again about the propriety and ethics team in the Cabinet Office and their um, like bodies in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So that's another way of reinforcing that. Ministers also have access to um, training and many of them do take that up, some through external bodies such as the Institute for Government, um, others training which we ourselves arrange and they attend. Um, you, you've referred in, in your statement to, to a declaration on government reform, mm -hmm. and I wonder if we can just briefly look, put that up on screen. Um, WYTN 7247002. Mm -hmm. um, so we can see the title of their declaration on government reform. Uh, and if we go just over the page, I just wanted to flag up two paragraphs that may be more relevant than some of the others. Um, for our purposes. So the first paragraph, we have and expect high standards for conduct in public life, but we must continually reinforce these with leadership, proper process and transparency so that the public can have trust and confidence in the operation of government at all levels. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth paragraph on that same page, improving how we operate in all these areas and more requires leadership from ministers and civil servants a willingness to challenge each other candidly, cooperate intensively and be open-minded about what needs to change because the scale of what our recovery must involve is, is huge. Um, so first of all, Mr Chisholm, just generally, what, what was the purpose of this document? Thanks very much. Yeah, so it's, um, to just to put it in context, so it's an agreement that was made um, by all members of the Cabinet and all permanent secretaries, uh, heads of departments, for the first time that's happened at a kind of special joint meeting of the Cabinet in June last year. Uh, it's a declaration in the sense that people are committed to both the, the goals set out there in terms of reform, but also the practices and indeed a set of about 30 actions that are defined there. On the particular points, I wanted just to emphasize this because of the nature of this inquiry uh, into infected blood, which is that um, it does take the opportunity to say that you know, the, the standards of you know, the behavior and values that people have to follow is absolutely essential to the work we do in government. It emphasizes that's a responsibility not only for civil servants, but also for ministers, and that we need to work together in that. I also think you're right to highlight the element which says that that challenge is important to that. Um, candor is the theme you're, you're, you're focusing on right now. A willingness to challenge each other candidly was absolutely embedded in that uh, declaration. Um, also the uh, open-mindedness, the possibility that you might be mistaken or wrong, um, and the willingness to review the evidence and update your, your thinking and practice in light of that. Um, some of the things you heard from uh, colleagues uh, elsewhere in the civil service around um, involving uh, uh, non-executive directors, uh, specialists with particular uh, scientific and other backgrounds, bringing people in from outside on secondments, um, having a very open recruitment policies, but also having a culture within the civil service of welcoming challenge and inviting people to uh, disagree and present an alternative view because it's through that process of internal uh, debate that we bring ourselves to the most likely version of the truth. Um, that is also, I think, important to recognize the context in which 
this declaration was issued, which was June of last year, um, we were still very much in the COVID mindset there. We'd seen all the um, experiences we had and that willingness to recognize not everything had gone perfectly and that we'd be keen to learn both um, through internal reviews that were happening at that time, through some external reviews that we had commissioned, and then, of course, through the COVID public inquiry, one of 15 public inquiries we have live at this point in time. Um, and if we just turn to page five of this document, paragraph four, um, uh, some of it, I think, is, is self-evident, mm -hmm. drawing um, teams from a range of disciplines and backgrounds and so on. Um, but I wanted to ask you specifically about the, the phrase red teams. We'll, we will use red teams and outside secondees to challenge conventional thinking, requiring that policy options be presented, showing how radical alternatives have been evaluated and considered. Mm -hmm. what, what's a red team and what's its role in yeah, that? It's, an, it's an inverted commas because it's a term that doesn't have general um, circulation, but it's, it comes out of the, the military and the intelligence agencies who've used them for some time. And it basically invites people to, to argue the opposite and to test the strength of your thinking. So if, for example, you're presenting a most likely scenario, you say, well, how robust is that scenario in the event of the following developments? And if you find that it doesn't stand up very quickly or well, that obviously isn't very robust. Also, um, a kind of stress testing type exercise. Oftentimes on red teams as well, you're bringing people in who haven't been involved in the creation or delivery of that particular policy. So they've got, they're not perhaps uh, overly invested in the practice that there has been and are willing to look at um, more radical discontinuities in thinking or practice. Um, so that's, that has indeed been a way we've used um, in the response to COVID and other, and other areas to test our thinking um, and to present the decision makers before it's, it's finalized the policy with an alternative view. Um, and I, I know that's been copied in some other um, areas of the service. I know that the, um, there's a kind of operating handbook that was developed post uh, the Chilcot inquiry, one of those major public inquiries that I referred to, for which this is, of course, one. And that, I know, has been uh, used not only uh, across the UK civil service, but you've, I think you've seen references in the evidence from, um, from Scotland and Wales to using those same techniques. And just so that, again, those un uh, uh, listening understand what that uh, document um, that you referred to is, could we put it up on screen, WITN 72470004? Um, this is a Ministry of Defence document, in, in a handbook entitled The Good Operation, but is it right to understand that some, at least, of the principles articulated in, or approaches articulated in this handbook um, are used more widely across the civil service? Yes, it is. Um, and, as you say, it arose out of the Chilcot um, inquiry, but if we just look specifically at what's said about groupthink, page 7, please. Um, and it's the uh, left-hand column, bottom of the page, where it says, in headline terms, the report suggests that government had a propensity for groupthink when a group of people conform in their thinking to the extent that their decision-making has an irrational or dysfunctional outcome, reflecting insufficient challenge um, and a lack of diversity um, of um, thought. And then there were suggestions, if we go to page 11... Um, uh, if we look at the left-hand column, please. So just beneath the first paragraph in bold print, it says that means, and then this, building in sufficient challenge, diversity of thought, and critical thinking to head off groupthink. Challenge can come through red teaming, where an independent group offers challenge, inviting diverse thinking, including independent or external viewpoints into the process, um, and wargaming. Um, and then there's a guide at the back of this um, um, which perhaps might be a little more specifically focused on, on the MOD's needs. But um, to, to what extent is this kind of idea of internal challenge embedded in, um, in most of what the civil service do? Or is it, is it something that's only occasionally used for the more high-profile or controversial policies? No, I think it's absolutely embedded. And, um, I mean, the, the point uh, well made there in that uh, first section that you highlighted is that the, the, prob the best safeguards against groupthink are um, to uh, make sure that there is sufficient challenge and that there is sufficient diversity of thought. Um, so I think that 
uh, right across the civil service, huge steps have been taken to improve um, in both of those. In terms of the diversity of thought, obviously that's to do with both the, um, the way we recruit people, where we recruit people. Most recently, we've had a huge step forward in our ability to recruit people across the whole of the UK through the so-called Places for Growth program. Um, also, in making sure that in our practices, um, we don't allow people to slip too quickly into a particular way of thinking that we provide for that constant challenge. Now, sometimes that can be from having explicit exercises such as the red teaming. Um, we have a huge amount of, um, of kind of formal uh, assessment. You get kind of reviews from the um, infrastructure and projects authority. You get reviews from internal audit teams. You get reviews sometimes and, and challenge panels set by uh, the Treasury or by different parts of the Cabinet Office. So that's a very normal type of um, uh, st state of affairs for us. Um, also, I think within teams, even without those formal reviews, um, the best teams do work with a kind of uh, habit of internal debate and challenge. And strong leaders will often you know, say, look, here's a proposition. Um, but um, you know, invite people to disagree with that and to test that internally. And that's much more effective when you've especially got people from, um, from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, and different disciplines and, and previous experience. And that is my experience of working in the civil service. It's a, it's a high challenge environment. Um, I should perhaps just finish by you know, mentioning the, some of the external challenges. Obviously, um, yeah, the inquiries provide that in a kind of formal way um, on certain occasions. But what is constant is the, the challenge that comes from parliamentary accountability. Um, and ministers obviously before parliament every, every week that it sits. But um, uh, civil servants like myself, again, are constantly giving evidence uh, to parliament. Uh, probably maybe 50 times myself in the last six years. So um, that habit of um, putting our, our thinking to uh, external testing, of course, all of that is televised and available um, on the parliamentary uh, website channels and so on. Um, that does provide, I think, a very good um, source of sort of testing and making sure that you're not getting involved in that uh, uh, group think as well as evidence of our candor. Um, in your statement, um, Mr. Chisholm, uh, at, I think it's paragraph 23, I, I don't know when he's put it on screen, but you say um, in relation to the idea of memory illusion, mm -hmm. people remembering things as they would like them to have been rather than they actually were, you say that's a psychological change by no means confined to civil service, but you say this, the civil service may possibly be more susceptible by virtue of its public service mission. Mm -hmm. um, could you just expand upon on that? Why, why is the civil service potentially more susceptible to that? Yes, I don't, I, I don't know if that's been strongly evidenced, which is why I said it's only possibly. It was just, um, you know, putting together that statement, I thought um, it might well be the case, because I know that a lot of civil servants, in my experience, um, do think of themselves as trying to do the right thing and acting in the public service. And indeed, that's really that sense of the public service is what draws people to enter the civil service and to stay there. So they're perhaps more likely to think that um, their fellow uh, civil servants and colleagues, people working in government, are trying to do the right thing. That might be the case if you were working for um, a narrow private interest. So that was uh, the reason that I said that. Um, so I'm going to move now to some themes and ask all, all four to contribute to, to various themes. But I've noted the time. Um, it may be sensible to take the morning break now. Uh, yes. Um, we'll, we'll, can I ask we make it slightly shorter than normal because there's still a reasonable amount to get through before the end of the morning, so perhaps 25 minutes, sir? Yes, well, in that case, we'll come back at 20 to, 20 to 12. Thank 20 you. to 12.